Sounds pretty good. All right, that's on. Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here in a second. All right. Let's go ahead and start off in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for giving us the ability to come here this morning, take some time to uh, study a lesson and just uh, understand it better and just continue to be with our hearts and minds as we're listening to this and we uh, can uh, use this to uh, better our knowledge of the gospel and also as just the uh, have an understanding of the Old Testament and how it relates to the New Testament and just carry that through the world so we can spread the gospel and always hold you at the highest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so this is an exciting week. We're going to study Leviticus 1 through 7. Um, so when Steve asked me to teach this, first I kind of stepped back and I thought, I've upset, upset Steve and he's mad at me. <laughs> so this is a little different one, but I actually think by the time I went through everything, this should be a really good lesson, and there's a lot of good stuff in here. It just isn't obvious. You have to look for it. Um, when is the last time you guys read Leviticus? Especially 1 through 7. Huh? Earlier. What'd you think? And actually, it's very detailed of everything that needs to be done. Um, and actually, you can go into numbers. Numbers goes into a lot of this, too, as well. But uh, to start off with, to understand Leviticus, there's no way you're going to understand Levit Leviticus, especially 1 through 7, without understanding the New Testament and the Gospel. So without that knowledge you can't understand what's going on and why it's going on. And we're going to get in that as we continue on and go through this. Uh, so keep that in mind in itself. Um, so what did we read about last week? What was the lesson over last week? We was in Exodus. We're talking about the tabernacle. So everything with the tabernacle is very detailed in how it needs to be laid out. So everything is arranged in a certain order. Everything's inlaid with gold. And it's prepared. So now, what happened after the tabernacle was established? And they set it up. Remember? God's now at the tabernacle. By day, the, the cloud. At night, the fire. So God's present with the Israelites in the wilderness now at this point in time. So now there's a realization of, we got a problem. <laughs> we have a problem that we are unholy, we're unworthy to be with in the presence of the Lord. And that's how this, a lot of this comes up. When you talk about sacrifices, though, is this the first time we talk about even animal sacrifices in the Old Testament? 
No, because we had Abraham sacrificed, and we also know that Noah sacrificed after the flood. So this isn't anything new, but at the level and the detail that it's given, this is new. Um, so and that's how it kind of lays out. There's steps and everything to to the sacrifice in itself. Um, Well, the tabernacle is the tent. Yep. So, yep. And this would still, this translates from the tabernacle once the temple's built, this practice continues on. Um, one thing my, I will, when you think about the sacrifices, what was it, right, right around over 600,000 Israelites were in the wilderness at this time. So this is a big camp. And you think about the sacrifices, the amount of sacrifices is really staggering when you think about how often they were sacrificing and what that would have looked like. So you think about daily sacrifices, blood, disposing of the ashes and things like that. Uh, one of the things I realized my wife rolls her eyes when I say this, is the Lord and myself definitely share a love for barbecue when you're talking about this chapter because you're using wood and you're burning up the animals in it. It's also very detailed in different portions that are offered to the Lord because we actually have, I'll go into that now, there's actually five different categories of sacrifices that are set forth. The first three are different from the last two. So the first three are kind of like ceremonial, symbolic offerings to the Lord themselves. The last two are just straight sin offerings. They're to make clean the sins in which you take part. Uh, the first offering itself that we discuss is a burnt offering uh, to the Lord. <laughs> and that's what we kind of get into in chapter 1. Uh, the burnt offering, we'll read, read a little bit about it, but it's an animal, and it's brought to the Lord, and it's completely burnt up at the tabernacle itself. Nothing is consumed, consumed by it by any of the priests or the people. It is a straight offering towards God. A lot of times you'd see these would be yearly, Sacrifices that you would give. Uh, one of the details, too, is when you read about the sacrifice in itself, it's not solely based just on you're going to offer a bowl, you have to do this. There's different levels. So it kind of gives some leeway because not everyone's going to have the same financial means. So if you can supply a, a calf, a bull, you do it, or a goat. And you can even go down to uh, turtle doves or pigeons. So, depending on your status, you could offer what you could give at that point in time. <coughs> the second is a grain offering. Grain offering, um, when we get to it, we'll point that out. This is called a memorial offering. So, this is done in remembrance of God himself. Uh, it stands out, it's a little bit different. Then the other offerings, keep that in mind. Uh, third offering goes into a peace offering. The peace offering uh, can be grain. It also can be um, animal. There's different conditions of how everything's laid out. These offerings, the priest would take part in and eat at the end. Also with the grain offering, the Sons of Aaron, the priests, could take part and eat that. When the peace offering, whatever animal was sacrificed, the family could also take part and have that afterwards. So the Lord would get his portion of what he's laid out. So it's very detailed. Uh, the fat and the organs were, were cut and then separated and then burned on the uh, altar for the Lord. Then... 
they had kind of had a celebration feast with everyone else. Then we get into the next two off offerings. The first one is a straight sin offering in itself. Um, you have different levels of sin offerings. Uh, it can be individual. It also has explanation of making a sin offering for the entire uh, camp to cover everyone. So there's different level, levels of these. It's very detailed in how that happens. Uh, those offerings were not meant for anyone to consume. They are completely burnt out. The strange part is you take the sacrifice itself, you take out the parts that the Lord wants, that's burned up, and then the body of the animal, whatever was sacrificed, was then removed from the camp and then completely and totally burned separate from the camp itself and the assembly. And the last one is called a guilt offering, which is in essence just a sin offering. But this offering was for someone that committed an offense towards someone else. If you stole from someone, if you destroyed someone's property, so it's a sin offering with a restitution component attached to it. So you had to repay back whatever you, offense you did, and then you had to go a fifth above that. So that's what your sin offering, your, your guilt offering is. It's just another sin offering with an added component to it. So that's really how it lays out of all these different offerings. So let's start looking at it and trying to understand more what's going on. <coughs> so in chapter 1, starting in verse 2, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any of you shall bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. So right here, when you're bringing an offering itself, you're bringing from your own herd, your own flock. You're making a sacrifice from your own, from what you have in itself. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. So note that, keep that in the back of your head. We're looking for a male without blemish. So you want the perfect part of your flock that has no blemish to it whatsoever. We're also looking at the male component of this. Later on, different offerings, sin offerings, don't have to be males. This birth offering has to be a male. He shall bring it to the entrance of meeting, that he may be accepted before the Lord. So at this point in time, he's taking his offering to the tent, to the tabernacle itself. He doesn't go into it. He comes before it, so he's there at the entrance itself. Then she'll, he shall lay his, lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. What's atonement? Anyone? Do we understand what atonement is? Atonement. Atonement, the way I read it and understood it, atonement is a cleansing portion of it. And that's, that's the definition I, I came up with. So atonement is a cleansing. Um, then he shall kill the bull, bull before the Lord. So this is, the person making the sacrifice is making, he's the one killing the bull. He's taking part in the ceremony in itself. This wasn't just all left up to the, the priest. At one with? Okay, I see what you're getting to there. So you're bringing with God to God in it's, itself. I've understood it as the cleansing and washing away to purify yourself to make one holy. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the same, really, we're talking about the exact same thing, different verbiage in there. <clears throat> and Aaron and the sons of the priests shall bring the blood, and so the blood against the sides of the altar at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and he shall flay the burnt offerings and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron's, Aaron, the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar, and arrange the word on the f- fire. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall arrange the pieces, the head, and the fat, and the wood that is on the fire on the altar, and the entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. And the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering, a food offering, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. That last part, the pleasing aroma, this is something that continually comes up also in all these sacrifices, the, the, the reference of a pleasing aroma. Any of that really makes sense? <laughs> it's kind of confusing when you read through it. I think one of the big reasons it doesn't make sense is because it's imperfect. But it gave them the ability to still have presence. So now we want to kind of look at the New Testament. We're going to look at Hebrews and some of the things that are said in Hebrews about the old law itself. So if you guys want to turn over with me to Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to start off in verses 19 through 22. For when every commandment of the law has been declared by Moses to the people, he took the blood of the calves and the goats. With water and scarlet wool and hippus, he sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant of God commanded for you. In the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tent and the vessels using worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The blood itself is the forgiveness of sins. So he's going back. We're sacrificing here forgiveness of sins using blood. If we go a little bit further down, it gives the first explanation of what this all is about and what it means. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1, we're going to go through 14. But for since the law has but a shadow of good things to come. So this law is nothing more than a shadow of good things to come. And we're going to break it down because he's directly bringing your attention to the sacrifice portion that it's a shadow of the good things to come in itself. Instead of the the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. The intent is to make perfect those who draw near, if you look back at that. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But these sacrifices they, there is to remember of sins every year. For is it possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins? No, it's not. And that's why the issue of sin is never dealt with in the Old Testament. I've heard a reference, uh, a good friend of mine, He always makes a comment that in the Old Testament, in the Old Law, it's like sin's there, but you're really just kicking it down the road. It's no more than kicking a can down the road. It never fully gets dealt with. And that's all you're doing. You're just kicking the problem down the road till you get there. (coughs) 
sorry about that. Back in verse 5, Consequently, when Christ came in the world, he said, and this is interesting in itself, because now we're going back, Christ is quoting Psalms here. He's quoting Psalms 46 through 8. So we're in the New Testament, going back to the Old Testament to get a more explanation of what's going on. Sacrifices and offerings you have not discerned, but the body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Pretty much saying perfection's not there. God, as it is written of me, it is written for me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasures in sacrifices or offerings or burnt offerings and sin offerings, these offerings according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first order to establish the second order. And by that we have been sanctified through the offer, offering of the body of Christ once and for all. We we'll go back. This is just a shadow of what's to come. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for for all time a single sacrifice of sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from the time until the enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all those who are being sanctified. Does that give any clarity of what we're looking at? To kind of help understand? All right. Now we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 2. We're going to look at the grain offering in itself. <coughs> There's some key notes in here when I read it that really stood out to me. And they needed some more explanation of what's going on. Starting in verse 1, and I'm going to actually read this whole chapter. So I have my apologies, but I think the whole thing has to be looked at to really get down to what we're discussing and why it's important here. <clears throat> when anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. Using fine flour, he shall pour oil on it and frankincense and bring it to Aaron, the sons of the priests. And he shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all the frankincense. And the priest shall burn at this time a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with, his, with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. I'm going to back up. I'm going to point out again. You're going to see this repeated over again. He's calling this a memorial portion. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons, the most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. Once again, this is going to be repeated through this chapter, through chapter 2, the most holy part of the Lord's uh, food offerings. When you bring grain offerings baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, it shall be fine flour unleavened mixed with oil. You shall break its pieces and pour it and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. And if your offering is grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made with fine flour and oil. You shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord and in its presence of, to the priest. He shall bring it to the altar. And there's some priests shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn it on the altar for the offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is the most holy part of the Lord's offering. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven, 
nor any honey as food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits you may bring to the Lord, but you shall be offered to the altar, altar for pleasing aroma. You shall season your grain offering with salt. You shall let the salt be the covenant with your God, missing from, should not be missing from the grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. If your offering and grain offering are the first fruits of the Lord, you shall offer grain offering, your first fruits, fresh ears, roasted with fire, crushed with new grain. You shall put oil and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering, and the priest shall burn it as a memorial portion. And then I'm going to stop there. We don't have to go the rest of the way through it. But what are some of the key things you heard in the grain offering that kind of stand out? All right. So really think about what do we do weekly as a memorial? What is a memorial? Yep. What's a more memorial? It's a remembrance. You're remembering something and bringing it. So you're making a memorial, just like a memorial day. What do we think of? Those who've fallen in service. So your memorial per- portion is a remembrance. So here we're talking about the memorial towards God. But does any of that sound really familiar? You're using unleaven in itself. This, sh- go ahead. Yes, as far as I know, that I know of, this is, the, this is a conditioning for what we do every week. The whole thing, all of the videos is conditioning for the sacrifice of Christ. This is a conditioning to relate to why we take communion. So if we go to... In 1 Corinthians 5, 6, it talks about leaven. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the entire uh, lump? Leaven's raising up. So you're not raising yourself up. You're making your offering pure and clean. That's why we don't use leaven. It's not puffed up for pride. We don't go to the Lord with pride. We go to the Lord humbled. Um, of course the memorial portion when you look at Luke chapter 22 verses 19 and he took the bread and when he gave thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body in which I give to you do this in remembrance of me that's the, the connection we're looking at the grain offering is our conditioning of what's to come. I'm also going to point out, in John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And then a few verses down, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. I also want to make a relation. We continually see through all of these sacrifices the pre- pleasing aroma. And in Ephesians 5 2, we walk in love as Christ loved and gave himself a point, gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice of God. Christ is the fragrant offering. Now, i got to get moving. We're going a little slow here. Um, 
Now we're going to go to the sin offering in itself. Ah. So we kind of change gears a little bit. So the portion I'm going to read here, we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 4. There's different levels of sin offerings in itself. The one I'm going to do is this, that we're going to read about is a sin offering. Go ahead. Absolutely, because the failure starts in Genesis at the tree when the fruit was eaten. Um, <clears throat> that's where this stumbling block occurs, and that's why this hurdle has to be overcome. Um, thank you. Greatly appreciate that. Um, but I'm going to go over the sin offering that's kind of designed for the entire assembly in itself. It's in the entire encampment instead of just the single sin offering itself. But if you want to turn over to Leviticus chapter 4, starting in verse 14. When the, sin, when the sin which they have committed becomes known. So here, and it kind of talks about it a little bit more in the earlier part of the chapter. But when the sin is revealed and they know that they've committed a sin... That's when they do this. And it's kind of resemblance to me of repentance, of like, hey, we've sinned, and we need to stop, but we need to make atonement. So there's an, a kind of a, a repentance part of this of like, we've screwed up. Because it even goes into detail talking kind of about if it was unknown, and then once it's revealed, that's when you need to do this. Um, the assembly shall offer a bull of its herd, a sin offering and bring it to the front of the tent of meeting and the elders of the congregation so lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord. So they're laying their hands on the bull. They're transferring that sin, whether it's an individual or in this case we're talking about the congregation, whatever that entire community sin is getting transferred on to the bull. And the bull shall be killed before the Lord. Then the anointed priest, the appointed priest, shall bring some of the blood of the bull into the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip the fingers of the blood and sprinkle it seven times before the Lord in front of the veil. And they shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar that is the tent of the meeting before the Lord. And the rest of the bull of the blood shall be poured out at the base of the altar and burnt offering as at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And then its fat shall be taken from, from and burnt at the altar. Thus shall we do with the bull as we did with the bull in the sin offering. So we shall, so we shall do this. So here's where he's referring back to the original sin offering that we didn't read about. But what they do, and he tells you, and the priest shall make atonement for them, and they shall be forgiven of the sins. And they shall carry the bull outside of camp and burn it up as he burns, as he burned the first bull. It is a sin offering for the assembly. So the bull is removed from the tabernacle. It's removed from the camp, outside of camp, and that's where the rest of the uh, sacrifice is burned up. Why would we do why would they do that? What's that? The bulls of the sin it has to be removed from camp. It's so it's separate. And what happened to Jesus when he was sacrificed? But where was he sacrificed? Where was he sacrificed? Was he sacrificed in the city? 
Turn over to Hebrews 13 and verse 10. And this is the best part of it. I'm not saying this. This is directly from Hebrews. We have an altar from which we have, from those who served the tent have no right to eat. For the body of those animals, those blood is brought to the holy place by a high priest and is sacrificed for sin or burned outside of camp. So Jesus suffered outside of the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go outside of camp and bear reproach he endured, for we have a lasting city, because we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. So you want to talk about reflection right here in Hebrews, Paul is saying, hey, the reason you took the bull outside of camp was because Christ was going to be pulled out of Jerusalem to be sacrificed. It's a direct reflection of what's, what's going on. It's the shadow. Um, so there is true meaning in what Leviticus, there's a reason why everything's being done. And that's why I say you cannot understand what's going in the Leviticus until you understand the gospel and you read the gospel of Christ. And it gives explanation for everything that's going on. It isn't obvious. It's not something that, <sighs> until I did my complete study and broke it down, and I'm not saying that everything is always perfect that I presented, but it's what it looks like. And I'm telling you, if anyone tells you they can explain it without the gospel, that's total hogwash. <laughs> that's a, because this is, going back to especially Hebrews, really lays it out of what's happening and what it's for. Um, we're looking for that perfect sacrifice. He's telling us there's good things to come. That perfect sacrifice is, is to come. There'll be one sacrifice instead of this repeated sacrifice. There had to have been millions of, millions of animals sacrificed when you're talking about those numbers and the time period that they did it in itself. Um, if we look at John chapter 1, verse 29... The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him. And he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The law was for the Jews. Christ's sacrifice was perfection, so it was for the world. Uh, another one I find really interesting is this is actually Jesus uh, in Matthew Chapter 9 and 13. I'll give you a second to turn over there. It says, Go and learn what this means. I, des I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call, I came not to call on the righteous, but sinners. So if you look at this quotation here, he's actually quoting. Hosea 6.6, 6, when he says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And when you flip over to Hosea 6.6, 6, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And the last part I'm going to talk about here uh, in these first seven chapters is... Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus left the temple, and he was going away. Then his disciples came to a point outside, came to a point, came to point out to him the building of the temple. But he answered them, You see, see, you see all these. Do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another, that will not be torn down. This is Christ calling, saying, it's coming to an end. Because all these practices that started in the tabernacle went all the way to the temple, and then that's when these sacrifices stop. It actually stops 
about 40 years after is when uh, Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was completely destroyed. But the meanings for these sacrifices were useless and never carried on after that. So I hope that kind of helps you a little bit in an understanding uh, of what it's talking about. Um, the last part, which we only have a couple minutes to hit, is in chapter 10. Um, Nahab and Abihu, do we all remember what happens to them in chapter 10? We got more fire. Uh, they're burned up at the tabernacle for uh, what pretty much what they do. Uh, let's just read the section real quick. If you turn over to the chapter 10, starting in verse 1. Now Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and, offer, and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all of his people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That's pretty strong. <laughs> uh, but the simple act, these were high priests, and they offered... Their offering was not authorized by the Lord, and they had quick action past it. As you read further through the chapter, and especially right here at the end, and Aaron held his peace, Moses kind of runs in at the end, kind of like their actions needed, needed to be dealt with, and he kind of warns them, like, don't, don't act. He says, don't tear your your cloaks or anything. Just continue on what you're doing not to anger the Lord even more. So, uh, that's a good point to bring out, to, to think about is what we're to do. It's laid out very detailed of how we're supposed to worship and we're never allowed or authorized to bring in our own beliefs. Go ahead, Mark. Yep. The sh that's exactly the same thing. Like, except here there was unauthorized fire. That case, they was lying about the portion that they sold of their land, of how much they was giving, and then they was instantly consumed. So, anyone have any questions? All right, guys, I appreciate your time and insight. Thank you. All those that added, and all right, bye.